There was a time not so long ago when there was a vigorous public debate over the possibility of human activities warming Earth's atmosphere and causing climates to change on a global basis. As evidence of rapidly rising temperatures and climate change increase, that debate is now virtually resolved. The vast majority of climate scientists agree that human activities are having an effect on our planet's atmosphere, and this in turn is causing the global climate and local climates along with it to change at rates that far exceed any natural rate of change. This is not news, however, to the MNR scientists and resource managers who have been observing and documenting recent changes to the ecosystems and resources they manage. What kind of changes are we seeing? We're seeing changes in temperature, in precipitation, uh, particularly the winter and summer uh, distribution of precipitation, the length of the snow-free period. Fire managers across Ontario have been saying something is changing out there. We are seeing far more extremes in weather and that thus far more extremes in fire behaviour. So we've all been seeing erratic and abnormal uh, situations occurring and that, that has had us very concerned. I've seen dramatic changes in the last decade in uh, the systems that I've been studying uh, that are clearly a result of climate warming. We've seen dramatic range boundary shifts and species hybridization and uh, quite dramatic ecosystem consequences. Our production of greenhouse gases is what's having the major effect on polar bears because it's affecting sea ice. It's causing declines in sea ice uh, distribution, it's causing declines in sea ice extent, and those are clearly having major negative effects on polar bear populations. We see less uh, water in the lakes, um, more streams drying up, more wetlands drying out, uh, th those kind of things. We see shorter winters, um, ice being less stable, snow levels being less, and of course people moving around that are depending on canoeing and depending on skiing, having a harder time doing that simply because the, the water conditions are changing. Water levels in the Great Lakes uh, decline because of more evaporation. Uh, those, those water level drops do have implications on, on protected areas. From 2000 to 2005, we weighed all of the animals that we handled. And that's allowed us to compare body condition of the animals uh, currently to what they were like 20 years ago. And the results suggest that the polar bears are in a lot worse uh, body shape than they, than they were 20 years ago. Their body condition has declined by about 15% on average. What we've been having in, the, in that part of Ontario, in the, uh, in, say from Moosonee to, uh, up to Cape Henrietta, Cape Henrietta Maria on the James Bay coast, we've looked at the weather uh, um, uh, record there. And from 1930 to 2003, uh, we've had uh, uh, increase in summer temperatures in every month from April to August. So we have warmer, summers and it turns out they're also drier. We've had a decrease in precipitation in the summer months. And when you start to look at this information you start to realize that these fish in terms of their abundance and, their, and the community structure is strongly influenced by climate and is changing dramatically. Climate change presents a tremendous challenge for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. All life on Earth, and nature as a whole, is inextricably tied to local climates, particularly temperature and precipitation. Individual species in Ontario and entire ecosystems will definitely be affected as temperature levels and precipitation rates are altered by climate change over the next century. Managing natural resources under these variable and essentially unknown circumstances will be a test unlike any ever faced before by MNR resource managers. There are many issues and concerns that will need to be addressed. Personally, I'm hugely concerned about climate change. Uh, I don't think it's in any exaggeration that it really is the environmental issue of our generation. Forests are vulnerable to climate change in, in a number of ways. I don't know that I could rank it on a scale of 1 to 10, but if you think about uh, the risk of forest fire, if you think about uh, adaptation of uh, trees to local climates, if you think about uh, the risk of uh, uh, pests coming into the province, uh, there, there are reasons for significant concern for Ontario's forests and climate change. 
species in Ontario tend to be well adapted towards certain ranges of variation of stressors like fluctuations in water levels, droughts, insect infestations, forest fires, uh, stressors along those lines. What climate change is really doing is making those things much more severe and much more frequent, uh, in many cases beyond the levels to which species are really adapted to tolerate. We are bound to have species extinctions in the province as a result of climate warming because there are many species that are simply not able to keep up with rapidly uh, changing climate. We're going to see the incursion of invasive species, the incursion of certain types of species that are, that are um, kind of generalist species that are rapidly able to move and keep up with climate um, changes and we're going to lose a lot of species that have small ranges and that have sort of specialized niches and that are not able to move rapidly. So I think that the net effect is likely to be a loss of biodiversity in the province as a result of climate change. If we're, if we're dealing with a variable landscape and a changing landscape, then the questions become, okay, if it's not going to be the same, what is our role? Is our role to aid the change? Is our role to define some positive changes and see if we can nudge things towards those? <clears throat> Is our role you know, to resist those changes to the bitter end? Whatever, and it's not very clear because our management plans are really about non-interference in a stable environment. And if we're moving towards possibilities like you know, more active in interfer interference in a changing environment, well, that's a whole new ball game. And I don't think it's one that our management plans and maybe even our act or anything prepares us to do. And I think that's one of our, our hardest things is the, the, the simple answers aren't there anymore. We develop an awful lot of resource management plans in many different ways. We develop forest management plans, we develop water management plans, uh, we, we, we develop plans to manage wildlife. And very few of those plans have even mentioned, let alone seriously tried to address the issue of climate change. Climate change is presenting to us a, a variety of possibilities. Are we going to have more water? Are we going to have less water? We know that the climate change projections are for more water but higher temperatures and that could mean more evaporation. Are we going to have periods where we're going to be stressing the water supply with our demand at different times of year, particularly hot, dry summers? And are we going to have a change in the spring melt period? So are we going to have a snow melt that's earlier? Are we going to have th summer thunderstorms that present flooding problems while we're trying to manage and deal with drought? Resource managers are also concerned about climate change and the impact it will have on our responsibilities to manage natural emergencies, such as forest fires, floods, and droughts. Now, the Ministry of Natural Resources has a lead responsibility in a number of areas for managing emergencies. Uh, in our area in particular, we have a lead responsibility for man managing in the event of floods and droughts. We have a lead responsibility for managing the uh, safety of water control structures and public safety around water control structures. And we also have a, a, a lead responsibility for managing for unstable slopes and soils and for erosion caused by water activity. And this could be due to uh, water moving down a river or it could be due to winds, such as on the Great Lakes, there's a lot of concern uh, for Lake Erie. We're likely to get more winter rain and less snow in the winter time. Uh, all of our power facilities are, are built contemplating that we're going to have stored energy in the snow over the winter time and in the springtime when that snow melts we're able to generate a lot of electricity from there. So if all of a sudden we have more winter rains and less snow we're going to be facing some uh, operating condition changes. Also, um, as, the, as the climate warms up, there's going to be more droughts in the summertime. So that means less water in the summertime. That means less potential energy generation from hydropower. As we in MNR begin addressing all the issues and challenges that are presented by climate change, we must also be aware of some of the misconceptions that still exist around climate change. So the four major misconceptions about climate change in northwestern Ontario that I see is first that it's all about temperature. It's not. It's about moisture as well. The second is that it's all about increase. It's not just about increase. It's also about the variation, the variation in uh, the climate and the weather patterns that we have. The third major one is that it's all about going from south to north. You know, it's, going to, it's just going to get warmer that we're going to have southern systems begin to replace northern systems. 
And uh, that's not really true because in northwestern Ontario, we're going to have a, a trade-off between the southern systems moving north and the western systems, that prairie influence, moving east. So we've got a lot of concerns about that one. And the final concern, or the final misconception, is that, is that climate change is going to happen. And we would contend looking at the weather patterns that we've actually been experiencing in northwestern Ontario and a fairly clear, well-documented weather record that climate change is already occurring and we're in a fairly significant trend in climate uh, change, particularly with temperature increase over the last 25 to 30 years. While there are many dire threats to Ontario's natural resources as a result of climate change, there are also a number of significant opportunities to mitigate or reduce the impact of climate change on Ontario's natural resources. Mitigation in a climate change context has a very specific meaning. It means reducing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Forests are an important tool that we have to help mitigate climate change. Forests themselves hold large amounts of carbon in the trees, in the soil, in the forest floor and down woody debris. When we sustainably manage forests, which includes harvesting forests and putting the woody carbon into wood products, we mitigate climate change. Wood products store carbon for long periods of time. Even paper, which is recycled or goes into landfills after it's used, stores carbon for 80 or 100 or more years. When we plant, regeneration often happens more quickly than when we, when we rely on natural regeneration. So planting forests can be a tool that we can use to increase carbon sequestration. Another key way m and resource managers can mitigate climate change is by suppressing forest fires, which release vast amounts of carbon from the wood they burn. Uh, our fire suppression program is extremely important in reducing greenhouse gas emissions from forests. The, the area burned in Ontario is, is uh, controlled in part by effective firefighting and without that we would see large areas burned in the managed forests and those forests would release large amounts of uh, carbon directly into the atmosphere. When it comes to suppressing forest fires, however, it turns out there are other important considerations. Of course, uh, there are scientists that say that uh, forest fires release a lot of greenhouse gases and carbon into the atmosphere and, and is compounding the problem. But on the other hand, the boreal forest is a fire originated uh, ecosystem and it needs fire in the forest in order for the, many of the flora, flora and fauna to grow. So where is the middle ground? Those are the questions that need to be answered by the scientists in, in MNR uh, and soon. Facilitating the production of renewable energy is another important way MNR can help mitigate climate change. By helping increase Ontario's output of energy from renewable sources such as hydro, wind power and biofuels, the ministry can help reduce Ontario's reliance on fossil fuels, thereby reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. We have to first of all understand as staff members what the energy situation is all about and how energy supply contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. We have to believe that we're part of the solution, number one. Secondly, we have to look at what, where the resources are and, uh, and start identifying those opportunities in concert with the industrial developers. Don't forget Ontario has a proponent driven process right now where it's the private sector that's responsible for investing in renewable energy and the government's role is to enable these projects to happen. I think uh, water power opportunities, we've got about 1200 megawatts or about another 10% um, of Ontario supply that we can supply from water power. Uh, we've done an assessment of Ontario's wind resource potential and there's a lot of interest right now um, along uh, the shores of north, northern shores of Lake Superior from Thunder Bay to Sault Ste. Marie and also in the eastern basin of Lake Ontario. So there's an estimate of 5,000 megawatts of additional wind power energy that we could take advantage of in the next 20 years as well. And that brings in m &R because most of those power opportunities exist on Crown land and we're the managers of Ontario's Crown resources. Forest biomass is plant material from the forest which can be used to produce renewable energy. It includes trees and the slash that is left behind after harvesting a forest. It's another area where m and can play an important role in helping mitigate the effects of climate change. 
Forest biomass can play a, a, an important role in mitigating for climate change. It plays a dual role, one in that it can produce bioenergy, which can offset fossil fuel use, or it can be used to sequester carbon. Ontario is proposing to have 1,250 new megawatts of bioenergy by 2025. This is a smaller chunk than wind and water for renewable sources. There is a biorefinery project that involves creating a new mobile biorefinery that can go out into the bush and reduce slash into uh, bio oils that can be used for electricity or other bio products. Now we have to take a look at how far into the forest we can go to make it economically viable for, for new and emerging industries and for the forest industry. And it's estimated that between 80 and 100 kilometers of trucking distance to the facility to develop the energy is an economically viable distance. The other side of the coin is uh, sequestering carbon in our forests and these, these have synergies between each other and both activities can be pursued in tandem. Um, there's afforestation opportunities and bio, biomass plantation opportunities that can be sequestering carbon and then we have a feedstock for um, producing bioenergy in the future.